We are starting. <laughs> uh, the dark doesn't shut him up either. Okay, I just wanted to uh, start with a quick um, explanation or disclaimer about the email I sent out said that um, this time uh, won't have so much philosophy, there'll be more astronomy as if whew, finally we got past that crap. Um, but in so fact, you can't um, get a sense of the history of any science without being aware that there's a continual churning and interplay uh, between the philosophical side and the very technical side, between theory and experiment and mathematics gets thrown in there. Um, it will rear its um, head again from time to time and these um, talks are going to take um, 15 half hours or if I haven't figured out how to do um, two, seven and a half of these to work out uh, the whole year. But um, anyhow, tonight is going to be a time when there's, there'll be a lot of progress without a lot of philosophical talk. But be aware of the fact that I may um, just break down and blurt out something philosophical and, oh, I forgot. <laughs> That's just the way it goes. And in fact, um, I'm going to start with from last time because are any of you new? Uh, any of you not here the last time? Okay, well, I, I figured some would be. So I want to make sure I pick up the story to get some continuity. And those that were here last time may have um, forgotten some of this or um, maybe it wasn't clear the way I presented it. This is the view of the cosmos at the time when tonight's um, history will begin, it's Aristotle's view. It's going to be the view that's going to persist for the next 2,000 years. Um, and part of it uh, will be familiar, all the ancient classical Greek stuff, and all, before that, the um, pre-Socratics, the very ancient Greeks, were pretty much convinced that everything that we can experience in the natural world is made of four basic elements. And here they are in the center of the cosmos. Earth, water, air, and fire. Now, Aristotle is going to use those, and his argument is going to be each of those elements has a natural place. That's why the Earth, although it's a mix of all these elements, is mostly Earth, and it's naturally in the center. And these are the natural places for the other elements. But they're all a mix. There is nothing pure about this. There are continual changes and reactions. And then the kind of motion we're aware of here, things tend to go straight until something bumps them. Uh, or they may go into a, an arch, uh, arc um, as they, if they're made mostly of the element of Earth, they'll tend to go to their natural place, which is down towards the center of the Earth. Other light things will tend to go up. But once you get to the moon, from there on out, it's made of that fifth element that Plato postulated, uh, mathematically can, uh, is known to exist. Um, it's all ether from here on out. It's all ethereal. It's the fifth essence. Therefore, everything out here is quintessential. That's where we get these phrases. From the moon and on. The other thing about that, though, is everything moves in perfect circles at uniform speed because this was the challenge that Plato gave to those in his academy, figure out how to account for all the messiness in the heavens as far as those planets, those wanderers, including the sun and the moon. They don't seem to go at a smooth, uniform rate, but we know the ideal from Plato's point of view must be something that's perfect uniform, rational. So figure out how to work that out, guys. Let me know when you're done. It's sort of A lot of people tackled this, and one guy in the academy came up with the idea of nested spheres. Not a new idea. The Pythagoreans suggested that before spinning around making the <coughs> celestial music of the spheres. But now um, Aristotle, in his rigor, said, it would take 55 of these nested to work it out. 
in detail. Um, and so this is a medieval view of Aristotle's cosmology. They didn't want to get into the fine details. That's all right, thanks Aristotle. We got the basic idea. And you can see that the spheres that have planets, they've worked out pretty well, the speed at which they're going. Uh, Plato, from the philosophical point of view, knew that there had to be one sphere that did not move there and without a cause. It was the uncaused cause, the unmoved mover. Well, that fit real well with the medieval mind in the Islamic world, Jewish and Christian scholars also. Oh, yeah, I, we get what you're talking about. That's God. Okay, and so this will be a cherished view of the cosmos. Um, the question is, why did this last for 2,000 years, though? Because this does not predict the motion of the planets all that well. The ancient Babylonians, with their numerology, could do a better job than this. Um, why was, why, well, one reason is because, okay, this fit what a lot of people thought was the important questions of the time. Uh, but the other reason um, is that Aristotle did, tried his hand at everything, not just astronomy, but all the other sciences, he didn't have time for everything, but he got folks at his school to pick up others. But he was real good at biology. We won't get into that, but he created the framework for making it a science 2,300 years ago. Um, but geology, botany, um, and also he wrote a book on this fiery realm here where things change. That's where we see meteors and comets, he thought at the time. Um, and so he wrote a book about things that were in the upper levels of the atmosphere, and it's called meteorology. That's why today studying the weather is Aristotelian term of meteorology. Um, but he was so good at so many other things, including logic. He invented logic. Uh, he wrote about poetry and politics, all this. It was a complete system. Nobody wanted to give up on something that fit into a complete system um, very quickly. But the other reason it lasted is because he had a student that I talked about last time. Um, little Alexander um, got um, going with an Aristotelian education that had to be shared with the rest of the world that he conquered. Um, and in that short period of time, the Greek worldview, the Greek language, is integrated with quite a range of other cultures. And the very first um, talk I did was about some of these other cultures. And so the um, people we're going to talk about tonight are going to be able to um, integrate all these very sophisticated sky watchers and the records that they kept. Sometimes their theories weren't very understandable or useful for further research. Uh, that will change dramatically tonight. After Alexander died, very young, uh, then very next year Aristotle died, um, the generals in his army uh, couldn't hold an empire together. There was nobody with the force of personality like Ar uh, Alexander's. And one of the generals, the smartest one, uh, very quickly ran off and grabbed the prize, which was Egypt, the richest uh, part of this empire. And um, the story tonight is going to be focused on Alexandria. But realize that all this information is now going to be accessible because Greek will be the lingua franca of uh, this area. And there'll be, uh, as I think I mentioned before, perhaps as many as a million Greek-speaking people in the period that we'll talk about tonight. So, um, Ptolemy's going to set up his central city, uh, not the way the Egyptians did it. There's no way that the seafaring, warfaring, highly energetic, um, highly commercial trading uh, people like the Greeks are going to put their capital way down on the Nile the way the Egyptians did to be away from everybody. Um, they got to be out facing the world, the sea, the traffic, and in charge of it. And so we end up with the, this place where the story will unfold in Alexandria becoming 
the foremost city of the world, um, probably the largest city of the world for a period, um, probably at least a half a million people. There have been claims for much more than that. It's hard to say. Um, some features there we'll talk about just briefly. But this is such a rich city. It trades with the world. Red Sea to India, uh, overland, uh, even with China, with intermediaries, of course, down into Central Africa, all the way to Britain. Um, there are peoples from all over the world living here. There's a huge Jewish settlement, uh, native Egyptian as well, of course, and a big uh, Greek settlement, but mixtures of all the other cultures. Um, and so this became a city, a polis in Greek, of the cosmos. And that's where the word is coined. This is where we get it. This was the cosmopolitan city. The first thing, obviously, you probably heard about. Um, I borrowed this from one of the Sid Meier's Conquer the World games. I hope he doesn't mind. But it just, it was there, laying there unused. And, but this is a fairly accurate uh, reconstruction that had been worked out recently. Um, but the real important facility there, as far as our story, story is concerned, will be the ancient museum, and there's the Greek spelling, um, which um, was dedicated, as a museum originally meant, to the muses. And there are quite a few of them. There's a nine or so that are commonly referred to today. To understand what a muse is, it's um, somebody that uh, would be an inspiration for metrical presentations um, and arts. That's why it's music, the metrical aspect. Um, it has to do with poetry and drama, the way it was delivered, comedy even, dance, of course. But the foremost muse for this place may seem surprising. It's Urania, Urania, the only one that's a science. And that seems strange when, when I first started thinking about it. how is it that astronomy became the subject of a muse, um, a metrical presentation in astronomy. I'm going to have to do a rap presentation here, I guess, or something. Um, or it, maybe it has to do with the celestial music of the spheres. In any case, the measurement uh, aspect, the mathematical aspect, is the dominant feeling of what astronomy is all about. So um, I'm not going to do a rap presentation tonight, although that would be amusing, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but this is a place that is very much in the mold of Aristotle and his school, the Lyceum. In fact, after Aristotle dies, the second head of the Lyceum is brought down as a consultant. How do you set up something like that? What are the important topics? What, if, what should we be about? Um, and so this ended up as not a school. You couldn't pay to go there. The best and brightest minds in the known, of their known world were paid to be there. And they were rich enough to get it, just about anybody they wanted. Um, they have access to um, a zoo, an herbarium, an astronomy observatory on the roof, of course, collections from all over the known world because um, Alexander gave instructions that important artifacts, natural artifacts, should be sent back to Alice, um, Alexandria. Um, and so they must have had a lot of neat-looking antlers stuck to the walls around. <laughs> Niche seashell collection, whatever. Um, but it's a research facility. It's a center for advanced studies. That should ring a bell, Carlos. Um, and it's the foremost place like that in the world, the only, in a sense, the only place like that in the world for, I think, more than a millennia. There are some other th things that later, in later talks I'll point to that are often th thought of as parallels, but there, there's some substantial differences in how they operate. But of course, the most uh, famous facility within there, if you're a scholar there, and there were up to a hundred of these, full-time paid, all expenses, uh, room and board, but they had access to this great library, and it's very much in the Aristotle mold. Aristotle had the biggest personal library prior to this time. He was known as a book collector. Um, so the recommendation they got uh, early on from the second head of the Lyceum, 
collect everything you can get from all the cultures, not just Greek stuff, but for all these other Babylonian and Persian sources, etc. You'll see a variety of figures. It's like the population too. It varies, but a half a million is uh, probably a realistic number. You see sometimes 700,000, whatever. But just remember that a book is a scroll, and if you think of the Bible as a book, you have to rethink that because think of all the books of the Bible. Each of those would have been a scroll. In fact, that's another big digression I won't go into, but the old, uh, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, is first translated here into Greek. So they had all those books. Um, and so we're going to have access as a resident scholar there and people today, the little, there's the library, of course, uh, was destroyed. Um, and we don't know exactly when, where, a lot of theories. Um, but even though it was destroyed, there were other books written about it or copied, made of copies. And as a result, we know not only what they did, but how they thought about what they did, how they reasoned about what they did. And this is a big difference from the other cultures that we had talked about earlier. Now, I, I put this together to help to give you a sense of proportion about how important the Museum of Alexandria was to this story, but in the history of science generally. Um, here is the timeline of the museum and a timeline running here from the classical era, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, to the Hellenistic, that's what we're talking about now, the Greekish, when it's mixed with other cultures, and then when it falls to the Roman Empire, and then the Roman Empire so-called falls, but it doesn't. It just continues in the Greek-speaking eastern half. Uh, and so it's something like, I don't know, 700 years. Now, everybody that's below this line worked at the Museum of Alexandria. These are the great names in the history of science during this period. If it's below the line, it's at the museum. I need to correct one thing. There's one name that just can't be there as, as in, in the history of science, except that he's the major roadblock to getting on with doing history. And those that were here before know um, about that. But um, they got around his um, warning that it would be impious to study the natural world. Um, they got around that, so anyhow, this is what happened. By the way, the other thing is that everybody that's red is Greek. The blue are the Romans. And I have to say, I put them in there as a courtesy mention, just because <laughs> you have to acknowledge, yeah, the Romans were there, but it's really kind of an oxymoron. I'm sorry, Steve. Lucretius is up there again, and Pliny the Elder. Um, but there are... Uh, people in the Roman Empire working at the museum, famous ones like Ptolemy and Galen, they're Greeks living in a Roman world. Now, the other thing I want you to notice, of all the science that's being done that could be called science, these are the ones that are doing astronomy, most of them. Now, there are mathematicians, there are physicians, some really famous ones like Galen um, and geographers, but most everybody is involved with astronomy. And I will try and explain why astronomy gets started as a science before all the others makes great strides. Oh, and it's, yeah, this is an important non-astronomer to the story. At the very beginning, he's um, at the very first um, beginning of the museum functioning, Euclid comes in. We don't know much about the person, but we know about his famous work, The Elements. This is second only to the Bible in Western culture in significance and how many times it was printed and how many people read it. It has a huge impact. He collated all the information about uh, geometry at the time and put it into this one extremely coherent um, text that shows you how to reason geometrically. It's more than that. It's that you know through every step, you follow the rules, that you are never losing hold of truth. You can probe the truth. Probe and prove are the same root. So you can prove things geometrically, using geometry. And uh, astronomy will get off to a good start. 
Now to give you an idea um, how important, the early Greeks we'd already mentioned knew about the Pythagorean theorem. The Babylonians knew about it, lots of people knew about it in general, but now you can prove that it's true. You can also prove that the square root of two is irrational. That was a big deal to the early classical Greeks. The story from now on is, ah, okay, it's irrational. They're gonna calculate it to zipteen places and start using it. That'll be a very different feeling about math. Um, and also, it explains a bit why some of the other sciences were slow to get started. It's hard to use geometry and reasoning about plants and animals and rocks, or the weather. We still haven't figured out how to reason about the weather very well. But here's somebody that's going to grab onto early on Euclid and make use of geometry, and he's going to try and, and calculate the sizes and distances of the sun and moon. I mean, think about other cultures, what you might know about in the mythology, what the sun and moon were for people, how they thought about them, what they were doing up there. Here's somebody, no, I'm, I know what they are. Their physical bodies are out in space, so I want to know how big they are, how far away they are, and here's how I'm going to do it. Geometrical reasoning. He knows that when we see a quarter phase of the moon, it's lit up by the sun hitting it face on. And if we're seeing it at quarter phase, we're looking at it here, and we've created a right angle. We've got some geometry going. But he also knows that when the moon is orbiting around here, sometimes it lines up such, you can see that it's the same apparent size of the sun, a total eclipse. So he reasons all you need to do, do is measure this angle here out to the sun, and then you've got enough to do some uh, relative size um, arguing or calculations. Now he comes up with a figure of 87 degrees. You may see this in a lot of texts. They didn't, at this point, use degrees. That's going to happen later tonight. Uh, at this point, he, he said that he thought the angle was um, no less than 29 thirtieths. It was all fractions at this time, sort of a sexagesimal system, but not all the way down to, uh, excuse me, 360 degrees in a circle. So that means that this angle here is three degrees. And his reasoning is, if that's the case, then he can figure out that that means the sun must be about 20 times larger and 20 times further away. Now, you will see a couple different versions of this. Um, the numbers are, vary a little bit, um, but this is sort of how the legend is stabilized. 20 times bigger, 20 times further away. But his reason, reasoning leads him to think, if the sun is so huge, it doesn't make sense that it should be spinning around the Earth so fast. And he modestly suggests, well, maybe the Earth's spinning around the sun. The first reaction from contemporaries is, wait a minute, if that's the case, if we look from the Earth here up at a star against other background stars, and then six months later we check it out again, we should see parallax. Can't see any parallax, so you're wrong. The Earth can't be moving in space. It, he could have said, oops. Instead, um, he says, well, maybe the stars are really, really far away, and so that's why we can't see the parallax. The counter to that then would have been, well, wait a minute, you got them way far out there? They still got to go all the way around the Earth every 24 hours. You got to go, go really fast to do that. That doesn't make sense either. Could have been another oops. Instead, he said, Maybe they don't move at all. Maybe they're spinning on its axis. So we got the whole Copernican system in the year, what, 250 or so BCE, um, and it's going to be forgotten to death. Um, but it is an argument that's based on very clear, sane, effective reasoning. His measurements are way off. The sun isn't the angle isn't three degrees, it's you know, a tiny fraction of a degree, and it's something like 400 times further away, 400 times bigger. But, you know, he doesn't have good sighting equipment, and besides, think how difficult it would be to measure an angle to the sun on the horizon. 
it's very difficult to figure out when the, there's a quarter phase to the moon, just visually. He was sophisticated enough to realize you also, he took into account the fact that if you're looking at a circle here, you don't see half of it if you're looking from here. You can't see half of a circle because you're looking at a cone, so you're seeing you know, something less than the median. And he had all these bits of the argument worked out. The measurements were off. Um, so the question is, why did he get forgotten? Why did nobody pick up on it? Now, there was one per person famously 100 years later in the area of um, Babylonia, um, conquered Babylonia, um, who did advocate the same heliocentric system. Um, but that's the only name we really know about. But when it comes time later, um, about two, two months later, when I get around to Copernicus, um, he, he mentions Aristarchus, but the, um, even Copernicus is forgotten about for a while, but those that are paying attention don't refer to it as the Copernican system. They refer to it not as the Aristarchan system either. It's the Pythagorean system. You remember that early thing? Oh, the Pythagoreans argued that the Earth was moving in space. Now, they didn't have it worked out like this. It wasn't reasonable. But what did they have in the center? A great central fire. And this is going to fit in real well with the Renaissance mind at the time, which is really into what's called Neoplatonism. Oh, God, philosophy, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but God and the sun were pretty much the same thing in imagery. So if you can put the sun in the center and the Pythagoreans put something that was probably the sun, they just called it something else, the hearth of the universe. Anyhow, that's why um, even in Galileo's time, they didn't refer to um, Aristarchus, they referred to the Pythagoreans. They didn't even refer to Copernicus by name uh, very much, or at least identify his theory that way. It was an old idea, older than Aristarchus. But he's the first one that's reasoned into something that uh, makes a lot of sense. Now, the reason we know about him is because of, here's Archimedes having his eureka moment. Um, what um, Aristarchus wrote has been lost, as so many things have from that age. But there is some surviving work of Archimedes, um, and in one of the things he wrote, and this is the alpha male mathematician of, of the ancient period. This is the brightest mind of any sort at that time. It's incredible. Um, and I won't go into it. Okay, ju we'll just leave it at that. But there's a lot of ways to make that case. But one of the things he wrote about uh, was explaining a new uh, number system he developed that could, uh, he could handle immense numbers. And to show off, he said, I'm going to calculate how many sands of grain it would take to fill the universe. And not only that, I'm going to use an example, the biggest sized universe anybody has ever suggested which is this guy Aristarchus who claimed there was no parallax in the stars. They were really far out. And so he went on to calculate how many grains of sand that would take. But that's how we know about Aristarchus. Later, he also wrote that he said at one point, Aristarchus uh, apparently was able to measure the um, parallax of the moon as <coughs> one 720th of a circle. That a 720th of a circle would work out to a half a degree. Wow. That's pretty much right on. We have no other information than this aside that Archimedes threw out. Um, and this is one of the hundreds of thousands of things that were lost when the museum's library was destroyed. And it probably was destroyed over several periods, over several centuries. But Now, here comes uh, somebody that's going to tackle uh, the problem a little differently, not a relative size, but an absolute measurement of size of the Earth using Euclidean geometry. I know a lot of these are uh, popular stories, and you probably heard these, so um, forgive me if I'm saying again things that you know well, but just to repeat the reasoning. Here's an obelisk in Alexandria, casting a shadow. Eratosthenes hears about uh, the, the reports that there is one day a year, one day only, that way down in the southern end, 
where um, Lake Nasser is today, called Syin, um, wells uh, can be seen, you can see the sun all the way down to the bottom one day only. Or obelisks, or gnomons, remember that word? This is a gnomon. It was put up as a um, honorific, but also they noted what it did to shadows. Uh, at Syene, this would cast no shadow one day a year. So here's his reasoning. Measure that angle, he gets seven and a half degrees, and you'll see some variations in this in various stories, but this is again sort of the central of the range of storytelling. Um, so his argument is that Alexandria, here's the situation, seven and a half degrees, there's the angle. Assuming that the sun's rays are parallel hitting the earth everywhere, which is a fair assumption if you can't see parallax in the sun, and knowing that a, an obelisk at Alexandria points to the center of the earth, as does an obelisk here, or a well going down would both point to the center of the earth, Euclidean geometry will allow you to positively assert that this angle here must be seven and a half degrees. You only then need to know the distance from Alexandria to Syene, 5,000 stadia, a stadium is about a tenth of a mile. Now again, anytime you see a nice round figure, be suspicious, but this is what you see, because the math works out, and we don't know exactly how long a stadium is. But the point is that whatever that figure was, he did it properly. Uh, and it wasn't a guess here, because they had professional paid walkers. That was their full-time career, was to walk carefully and report distances, because trade depended on that. And the Romans, of course, will pick up on this later with their milestones along those great um, roadways. Um, but the Greeks had done that too. So you mu figure out that angle, how much you have to multiply it to get a full circle, 48 times that figure gives you, it works out to 24,000 miles which is pretty damn close. And it doesn't matter whether you argue, no, they couldn't have gotten exactly this and that. He was, whatever his measurements were, he did it right, and it wasn't far off in any case. Not only did he do that, he also drew the first real cartographic map with latitude and longitude. They are working out this business of latitude fairly easily with gnomons and shadows and the positions of stars, etc. And even though Polaris isn't there, other stars could be, angles could be measured. Uh, and so the known Alexandrian Empire conquered world and some other things that weren't a part of that are added to it. Um, I don't know whether it's Norway or whatever. Um, and notice on this, you got Alexandria here. Look where Syene is. It's on a tropic of cancer. And so that's the definition for where the sun is that only one day a year. Eratosthenes uh, uh, was nicknamed Beta, um, which um, sometimes is taken as a denigration of his skills. The second best at everything. It was actually, if you're a mathematician, everybody Archimedes is Beta. Um, but he was good at everything, and so it was a, he was a jack of all sciences, and it was really meant as a uh, honorific. Um, his map also was important because it suggested that Africa could be circumnavigated as could the whole planet, and this uh, was to give rise to several desires to um, sail out in the blue beyond what seemed safe. But probably beta mathematician is not Eratosthenes, this guy. This brilliant mathematician uh, from Perga, which is a small town in Turkey, near the coast of Turkey. Um, he um, studied at Alexandria, all the people we mentioned one way or another, whether they lived there most of the time or some of the time, they came through there, they studied there, they met each other, they corresponded and it was a central source of information in their lives. Um, he develops one of the real treasures, mathematical treasures of the ancient world called on conics. Um, 
And it's a demonstration mathematically how taking a cone and slicing it, you can mathematically make transportation, uh, transformations from a circle parallel to the base, to an ellipse, to a parabola, to a hyperbola. You know these words. They are uh, Apollonius's words. He coined them. And he suggested that using those transformations, there are ways to use circles um, that maybe could solve some of these errant motion problems of the planets. Explain in uniform circular motion what is apparently not uniform and not circular. And here's his most famous suggestion. Put a little circle, an epicycle, uh, and have it circulate around a larger one called a deferent. And if you watch a spot on that epicycle as it rotates once counterclock or once clockwise, while the epicycle itself orbits or circles the deferent uh, counterclockwise, but just watch that point, it ends up drawing. That's the ancient Greek <laughs> expression, QED in, Rome, in Latin. Uh, I told you so in English. Um, there it is, the ellipse. He's going to explain how we can have elliptical motion of the planets. But obviously everybody realized, well, this is silly. No, no object's going to move in an elliptical orbit. That makes no sense. The only thing that makes sense is things moving in circles. Why does this make no sense? They're not going to, they had it so many years ago. And nobody wanted to use it directly that way because you'd have to explain why this planet is curving very tight here and going very fast and then slowing up and the angle changes, then the angle changes again and speeds up, then it slows up and the angles changes. All these changes going on. Warning buzzer, philosophy's coming up again. I just I can't <laughs> avoid this. Because if you can explain something with fewer causes, fewer hypotheses, you are to prefer that. It's called Occam's razor, and we'll get into Occam in a month or so, too, and his impact. Nobody bought into the elliptical primary motion because it was more complicated than it needed to be. You could explain it without that. Now, he suggests something else. There's another way you can get irregular speeds. Instead of having the deference centered on the Earth, have it off-center, have it eccentric to the Earth. And you notice what happens if we have something moving in uniform circular motion, but we watch it from here, when it's closer to us, it'll seem to move faster and then here, and it'll seem to move slower. <coughs> That's a neat little trick. And so, um, now, Picture what, let's see, uh, for about 1,700 years later, there's going to be somebody looking, reading through this stuff, knowing the ancient stuff, seeing the deferent off center, seeing that you could have an ellipse there. If you have that Earth off center and another one just like it on the other side, they are the two, oh, two f f uh, f focuses. Well, uh, of an ellipse. That's how you make an ellipse, the two foci, um, and Kepler is going to have this dawn on him, looking at some of these ancient suggestions of off-centered rotation, uh, off-center from the Earth, and the possibility of this being a real um, pattern of motion for the planet. But that will be, that'll be coming much later. By the way, and I think I mentioned this a year ago, but I just have to say it again. There, in, in 2006, there was a total eclipse of the sun that passed right over this area. You can't see this is the coast of Turkey going through here. This is Cyprus down here. Um, and it passed right over this place where astronomy first becomes a science, so there was no way that I was going to miss that opportunity. So I went there to see the eclipse, and I'm in this picture somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure I'm looking up, and I'm just underexposed. Um, but anyhow, it was a great experience. So now we come to the alpha astronomer of this time, the foremost ancient astronomer, not the most famous. Um, 
but um, he's the reason that others could uh, gain fame. Uh, more of that in a bit. So here he is. Uh, it looks like he's in Alexandria. It looks like he's in Egypt, where this drawing is. But in fact, uh, he was at the museum for a while, but he did most of his work on the island of Rhodes, uh, not in Alexandria. But um, he's going to devise all sorts of sighting and measuring instruments. Um, and here he is um, sighting uh, with an uh, instrument of his design using triangles to measure <coughs> angles and distances and to work out the math. He creates the math. And what do you call in Greek the uh, measurement uh, by triangles? This is a Greek word. He, he devises the math to do this. And as a, an example of how careful his measurements are, um, one of the things he tackles early on is how long a year is. To this point, it had been taken that a year was 365 and a quarter days. Now, he comes up with this figure. With his sighting instruments and his reasoning and his math, and he's way off because you can see what the actual <laughs> figure is. <laughs> Six minutes off. Okay. Pretty good stuff. Um, by the way, looking at this picture last night, I sort of clutched my chest, and um, I will come back to this at the end, because it's something I had missed uh, quite a bit um, in using it in the past, but I'll come back to that. Here's another device that he created. Um, it was a diopter, and he got it from, uh, this must have been around quite a bit, you take an equilateral triangle, um, with a plumb bob, and you can sight across this side when the plumb bob is across the um, point of the uh, apex of the triangle. Um, but then if you put a protractor down there instead, then you can measure elevations. With this, you can measure azimuth, keeping everything at the horizon. Now you can do altitude, you stick them together, and you've got this diopter thing where he can now position work out angles for stars in the sky. And what he's going to do now, unlike Aristarchus, Aristarchus used qualitative measurement, qualitative reasoning to come up with um, good sound arguments for the sun being pretty big and pretty far away. Um, and uh, other things he tackled were all in that vein of demonstrating the youth of math um, use the use of math and reasoning, but now uh, Hipparchus is going to go for accuracy, um, and we're going to get quantitative observations. Uh, oh, one more tool that he used, it's real simple, uh, but and people hadn't thought of it, I guess. Uh, this is an image from first class. Uh, you know, we've got a solstice in the summer, furthest north, and a solstice in the winter, furthest south. In between is an equinox. But strangely, <coughs> uh, the attempts to uh, calculate an equinox are, were difficult. Uh, it's not just exactly halfway in between, because they discovered early on that the time to get um, from a solstice to an equinox one season, from there to the next season to the next, the distance of, between those seasons isn't equal. So. He came up with this thing, the equatorial ring, such that <coughs> it's a device um, um, that will give you a shadow from the sun that lands on the opposite side of the ring, only on the day of an equinox. Simple device, and it's going to be incorporated into a more complicated device in a bit. Now remember, Aristarchus was challenged by the idea of parallax not showing in the stars. <coughs> but Aris, um, excuse me, Hipparchus is going to make use of the concept of uh, parallax in um, figuring out some of these issues that um, um, Aristarchus tackled, the sizes and distances of the sun and the moon, but he sees a way to make use of it. For instance, the moon does have parallax. Mm -hmm. And his argument was really interesting. Nobody thought of this before. Um, but the moon orbits 
So the thought would have been at the time, the center of the Earth, we know it's actually about a thousand miles inside the crust, but good enough, center of the Earth, but we can't see it from the center of the Earth. We have to see it from the surface. So we could watch the moon's position here relative to the distant stars, and then um, 12 hours later, watch it from here, and we see parallax. And he came up with a figure um, of seven minutes, pretty far off. Um, but it's a datum um, point that he's going to incorporate. Now, he could not find parallax in the sun. Um, so you can then assume that the rays of the sun are coming down, hitting everything in parallel. But he's going to take advantage of some other things in um, working out. He writes a book with the same title as Aristarchus. Um, again, this total solar eclipse, uh, we know the apparent sizes are the same, but he went further than that. In the year 190, some references say 189, um, everything is from a copy of a copy of a copy, and some of this information is 900 years after the fact, with a piecemeal piece of papyrus. But anyhow, um, more or less at this time, well, there was an eclipse at that time. We know of an eclipse that year. Um, at the Hellespont, which is what they called the Dardanelles up there, you know, the waterway uh, between Greece and Turkey, um, they knew that latitude was 40 degrees north. But the same day, observing the eclipse at Alexandria, it's only 31 degrees north, but you only get a partial. And it was, he measured it as four fifths. That's a little bit off. Uh, but that's enough information then to do some calculations, and he came up with a figure of the distance to the moon at about 40, uh, 77 times the radius of the Earth. But he didn't stop there. He then used a um, lunar eclipse as a way to get a new perspective, uh, a new measurement um, on this. Knowing that if you watch an eclipse of the moon, you get a curved surface, one of many reasons nobody thought the Earth was flat. They all knew it was a sphere. But they could uh, time the crossing, and they came up with figures around twice to two and a half times uh, the, for the shadow, the size of the shadow compared to the diameter of the moon. Now, if the sun's infinitely far away and all the light rays are parallel, then the shadow of the Earth must be a cone. So the Earth must be two and a half times the width of the moon. But he didn't buy that. He figured that there was parallax, but it was too difficult to measure. So instead, he tried, uh, he made an assumption that there was parallax, but it was at the limit of our ability to detect. But he used a, f a figure of seven minutes again, which is pretty big. Um, but with that, um, and the other, information he's been collecting, he came up with an estimate of the distance to the moon at 63 times the Earth radius. Again, he's way off because it's actually 60. Wow. Wow. Pretty amazing stuff. Um, again, think of what other cultures were doing with attentive to the sky and phenomena, but not doing much with it except keeping num tables of numbers and advising the emperor um, what countries to conquer, or um, whatever. Um, this is a very different thing that's going on here. Now, here's his great um, device. It's not clear that he developed all the details of this, but he's generally given credit as being the one to make this thing, the armillary sphere, a great astronomical tool. He apparently credited Eratosthenes with starting this as a sort of a teaching aid to reason about the heavens, uh, but he refined it quite a bit. And so I assume you're all familiar with this, but let me just make sure, go over some details. Um, this is the equator of the Earth projected into space. This is the path of the sun, the ecliptic. Um, where it crosses the equator, of course, is an equinox. And where it reaches its greatest height of this position of the sun, that would be a tropic. The word in Greek means to change. 
if when you have a solstice, it stands still for a while, but however it got there, if it came south, it's now going to change direction eventually and go back. So the word tropic means that's where the sun changes its direction, and it does it in the constellation of Cancers at that time, so it's the Tropic of Cancer, and down here would be the Tropic of Capricorn. Um, he also knew that uh, this obliquity of the ecliptic, the 23 and a half degrees, must indicate that there is a place on Earth above and below where the sun uh, would create one uh, half year day and one half year night. And so the Arctic and Antarctic circles are a part of their awareness theoretically at this time, mathematically aware of all this. So that's the armillary sphere. Um, The position of the um, uh, signs of the zodiac are spread around here, and um, that's why, even though I have a natural resistance to getting into the astrology of this, this is going to be an important reinforcer for a lot of people um, in the value of astrology. And the Babylonian stuff is now coming into the Greek world, being mixed as a part of that conquering that Alexander did. And so Hipparchus is sometimes given credit for starting the big astrology stuff, but in fact, uh, he probably didn't uh, do much of that at the time. But later, looking back on his work, people said that must have been the person who gave us a way to understand it all. Oop, nothing happened. Oh, no, did, you saw what happened? I need to go back and do that again, uh, because this is important. Um, he sees a new star in the sky, a nova. Um, now, Aristotle um, says that everything up there is made of ether. It is eternally unchanging, moving in perfect circles, never changes for eternity. Here's a new star. You either assume that you made a mistake or Aristotle was wrong. In any case, the only way you could be sure you didn't make a mistake, let's get all the stars positioned so we know exactly where they are. Then we can tell if a new one shows up. And so he then sets about plotting the points, the positions of 850 stars on the armillary sphere using coordinate system now like um, Eratosthenes did on a map of the Earth. Um, we're not sure whether he's based it on an equatorial system, an altitude and uh, azimuth, um, or the ecliptic like the Babylonians were doing. Um, but uh, it's certainly possible that he was doing this since that information is available to him and we know he is making use of Babylonian tables. Uh, and he puts together this first, really the first star atlas in 129 BCE. Now the Chinese also were doing some star atlases at the time too, um, but um, they haven't survived nor has um, Hipparchus's. At least that's always been the assumption. Um, with his star atlas now, keeping very careful records with the instruments so they can be precise about location. He compares his data to the first astronomers at the museum. Now he's here a couple hundred, well, 150 years or so after the museum got gone. There were two um, astronomers at the beginning. Um, Timocharis was one of those who uh, kept records and where the stars were. And he noticed that the positions that he got, particularly for Spica, I prefer Spica uh, because you can speed on to Spica rather than spike to it, but anyhow, um, it was two degrees off. And again, it's one of those things where he could have said, oops, but he was so certain of the care he was taking in his observations that he argued that there was something that existed in the heavens that nobody had even suspected you could look for. Um, this is brand new, um, and that's the precession of the equinox. Um, 
Now, this is the model that you generally see explanation, the way we would understand it today, is that the Earth is spinning on its axis and um, hence the uh, position of the pole where it points in the star field changes. And his argument is if, um, whoops, what happened? If, um, yeah, well, oh, I did get some. His argument is, of course, uh, he would not have thought the Earth is wobbling. That's, the Earth is solidly in the center. It must be the heavens that are wobbling. Something is moving up there. It's the stars in the zodiac that are changing. Um, so he reasons that if it changes two degrees in 150 years, it's one degree in 75 years, which means to go around 360 degrees, it would take 27,000 years. And again, way off, we have this figure today. Um, but that's pretty remarkable that he has discovered something based on his observation, based on his model of the cosmos, there's something that needs to be changed. And so um, that's why I'm going to argue that this is the time that we can say science is beginning. I should just um, point out, uh, I assume everybody is aware of this 26,000 year cycle, but um, this is the period we're talking about. There is no Polaris, but this is why the Greeks are using the circumpolar stars, which are the two Ursi, Urs okay, the bears, the big and little bear, as more or less indicating north. Um, and um, the Great Pyramid, Pyramid, which is oriented with the shaft of the, from the Pharaoh's tomb pointing to the celestial pole, not Polaris, but Thuban, and of course you know that eventually we'll have a real nice bright one near that pole position. Um, but here's um, the reason that I see this as being the beginning of astronomy as a science. We have this model of the cosmos. Um, and Parkes has developed this very carefully. He discovers something through observation that means he has to change, make a change. The um, there is a new motion in the heavens, never suspected. It will be explained differently later, later. But I think this is science. This is a definition that I use. There are many definitions. But it's not just a collection of facts. Uh, it's not just a collection of theories. It's coming up with a theory, coming up with a model based on observations, continuing observations, and seeing a need to change your theory or model. And that's happening now. That is science, I think. Now, here's something else that um, is pretty remarkable about Hipparchus. Um, if, I didn't know how to do this, but if you can imagine looking down on a, um, you know, maybe I should bring this out now. Um, Rob's always bringing things for show and tell. So. If you can imagine looking down on an armillary sphere from the top, projecting it into two dimensions. Hipparchus developed the mathematics to, to <coughs> convert from the three-dimensional to the two-dimensional uh, representation. And what do you get? If you look down on the top, you get this thing. Uh -huh. He may have, again, don't know for sure, but he may have been the person that developed the astrolabe. He certainly developed the way in which to lay it out. He had something like that, a two-dimensional flat surface uh, sighting instrument, uh, and it will take off uh, big time in the medieval period. But essentially, it's just a two-dimensional representation of that three-dimensional object. Um, so, yeah, I was ready to, to bring this out anyhow, let's see. Um, the reason I brought this, I was planning to show this, is I got this a couple years ago um, at a furniture store. These things have always been popular with interior decorators. <laughs> okay. uh, it's like the homes that have a telescope sitting by the big plate glass window looking out. If you've ever looked through a plate glass window with a telescope, you know the problem. Um, but um, the details are big diversion. I ended up with a store credit 
uh, at a furniture store that was a long ways from home. And either I took something from the store or I'd never go back and it wasn't enough money to get a nice big piece of furniture. And I looked over and oh, I always wanted one of those, I'll take that. And I got it home and I sat there and I got so angry. <laughs> I don't know whether you can see a problem with this. Um, first of all, the angle here, is, it's set for 60 degrees north. Okay, I mean, it'd be fine in Juneau or Oslo, but um, that's all right, I can live with that. Okay, we've got uh, the uh, ecliptic here, that's nice. So this is the equator, and where it reaches its greatest height, okay, there's uh, the Tropic of Ca uh, Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn, Arctic Circle, Antarctic Circle. And what the hell is this thing? <laughs> well, it's there because the person who designed this for a living room said, well, an armillary sphere is a thing that has all these circles in it. So let's put a bunch of circles in it. Ah, well, I, that, I was going to um, leave this as a test to see if anybody, after we turned on the lights, could figure it out. And then last night, I don't know why, I was going through the slides, preparing them again, and I returned to this image that I've used. This is the promotional image on the website for the talk. It's an iconic image of Hipparchus and his instruments he designed and his armillary sphere. And let's look more closely at his armillary sphere. Uh, okay. Well, we've got an Arctic Circle. We've got an ecliptic crossing that top one, and that's the Tropic of Cancer. So below it must be the equator, and that must be the Tropic of Capricorn. The ecliptic keeps going, so that's the Tropic of Antarctica, I guess. And it goes in beyond that. Um, not only that, uh, what's the latitude this is for? Oh, okay, this is um, good for zero degrees north. Uh, th this toga is not going to be warm enough for him tonight if he's using that at the North Pole. So. Um, I have to apologize for uh, not having noticed that in the image before, but it's the same sort of thing. It's become an iconic sort of image. It means um, it's something that implies interest in the world and being bright and intelligent. So let's put one in the living room and let's put this thing here because this guy was really bright and I don't know exactly how it works. But it's so simple, I sort of uh, think of um, it is something that uh, should be used um, in classes more. I don't know if any of you ever saw one in grade school, high school. I don't know why. I mean, it's so um, straightforward. And um, we had one of those, and those are really nice for the stars. But this tells you some really basic things um, about how the celestial spheres work. You get an equator, you get that motion of the sun, this idea of the tropics, um, and you can do some other things here with it too, and make sense of the uh, zodiac in a way that's uh, better than reading the paper each day and find out your horoscope. <laughs> so anyhow, that was um, the, what I see as the golden age of ancient astronomy. But what follows um, is interesting in that how many of you had heard of Hipparchus before? I assume quite a few. And some of you didn't? Okay, it'd be fine if, because I, when I give public talks, most people say they hadn't heard of Hipparchus. Uh, but you say Ptolemy, they've heard of, a Ptolemy, of Ptolemy. Uh What follows because of Hipparchus is the most incredible mechanical device that's um, more than 500 years old. Um, I say that right? Um, the Anakithra mechanism, which I'll talk about later. And then the most famous book of astronomy for 1,500 years or so is Ptolemy's Almagest. And Ptolemy basically was able to do this because he had access to Hipparchus' writings. And there are many people that have been arguing that most of his Almagest is just um, taking a parkas and figuring out the extra precession that's needed. Uh, not fair. Ptolemy's a pretty bright guy and he did some other things he had, but it's a refinement. It's an addition to the core of the work of Hipparchus and neither of these things could have happened without the sophistication that um,
Hipparchus uh, was involved in. So that's pretty much what I was going to talk about tonight. It took less time than I thought. So if we have questions. Actually, I just realized there's some things I skipped over because I thought there wouldn't be time. <laughs> if you don't want to see them, then I'll, uh, I'll be fine with that. But there's just two slides here. I mentioned these before, I think, last year, but uh, there's been more writing about them. Um, remember I said that his star atlas was thought to have been lost? Um, there is this famous sculpture in Naples of Atlas holding up the celestial globe. Um, and by the way, that's what that's literally an atlas, a celestial globe. That's why we use the word. Because Mercator, when he published his maps, he called it an atlas, you know, from this guy. Um, anyhow, a hundred years ago, somebody looking at this noticed on the back side that the uh, one of the ears of the ram, Aries, is on this line which is the equinox line, called an equinoctial color, ridiculous name. Um, and so he figured that that must have been the position of the star um, Gamma Ari, which is um, the, you know, ram is made of a few bright stars, so he figured that must have been it. But it's located on that equinox line, equinoctial line, um, which means that this was thought to be have been a Roman sculpture in the year 150 AD, but the procession is off by four degrees. It means that that must have been made in 150 BCE, based probably then on the lost star atlas of Hipparchus. Mm -hmm. Since um, a couple years ago, a, an astronomer published, rewoke this argument, and uh, again made the same case, but since then, uh, it's been pretty much downplayed for a bunch of reasons. One of the obvious ones, notice how sloppily this is drawn. <laughs> Here's the equator not crossing the uh, equinox, not the ecliptic, uh, the ecliptic slide, I'm sorry, uh, not crossing at the right place. And that's a pretty big degree of error. Uh, there are no stars on this thing. It's just pictures of animals. So it's a pretty weak case. So we can... Um, maybe assume that the ancient atlas is still lost. Um, and one other thing I forgot to mention about Hipparchus is that we have as a legacy, um, the magnitude system is also his. He said the 20 brightest stars, you know, will give them uh, a one and then go down to the smallest um, that we can barely see at six. And we made it logarithmic now, but we've kept that idea. So anyhow, that's all that I was originally going to go. That's only another five minutes. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, and are the skies good enough to look through scopes? I don't know. I don't know. OK. Well, then I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.